Good afternoon, everyone. It's indeed a pleasure to be here uh, in Rome uh, and to talk on infertility, uh, a global health problem. FIGO has, um, as uh, Dorenzo said, that we have 131 societies now, and uh, we have a reproductive medicine committee of FIGO, which um, uh, looks after the working of that aspect. And um, I'm going to now evaluate <clears throat> and tell you exactly what is happening globally as far as the health problem of infertility is concerned. Now, infertility is a disease of the reproductive system which affects both men and women with almost equal frequency. <clears throat> A global health problem with some portion of every human population which is affected. And they estimated that average 10% of the global reproductive age population is unable to get pregnant. <coughs> which means that large population of people need some kind of health support as far as fertility is concerned. Now, all the cultures, their definition of infertility varies. There is no universal definition, but the couple generally consider clinically infertile when pregnancy has not occurred after at least 12 months of regular sexual activity without the use of contraceptives. Now, if you look at the prevalence, there are 60 million and 168 million people worldwide where the infertility problem exists, and one in ten couples experience primary or secondary infertility. And the majority from the developing world, because if you look at the total population of the developing world, uh, India alone is 1.2 billion people, and so also China. So the majority of people are there in the developing world. Now I want to specifically mention the definitions so that we understand what we mean by the uh, public health issue. Because WHO described health as a state of complete physical, mental, social well-being and not merely absence of disease or infirmity. And when you look at the IIME classification, it says the International Institute of Medical Education defines public health as the organized effort of society to protect, promote and restore public health. Now people's health need to be restored which means that if a patient, a woman is infertile or a man is infertile, um, it's something which needs to be looked into and it's not, treatment is not luxury. Patients require something and it requires a health problem which needs to be looked into. Now the reason why we are looking at infertility as a public health issue is that when it comes to the international level, insurance companies don't support infertility treatment because they feel that it is not a disease or something which is not um, needed as a treatment as far as men and women are concerned. So the infertility is common with sizable couples of reproductive age experiencing difficulty in becoming pregnant and a portion of every population on the globe is affected. So it's all over universe that you will see that. And it is a public issue because it is socially constructed existing at the crossroads of medical and social realms. It's not only medical, there are social issues which need to be looked into. So there is a combination of medical and social realms that need to be looked into. In parts of the world, it is intimately linked with AIDS and STI epidemics, unarguably some of the most pressing health issues of the modern era, and that requires proper evaluation. Now, what are the consequences of infertility? You have a major life challenge. You have decreased level of personal well-being, life-threatening medical intervention, psychological, social and physical suffering, especially in developing world where women are considered as inadequately uh, positioned if they have not produced a child. There is a huge financial burden as far as infertility is concerned. And women, 
its well-being appears to be more seriously affected than men's because even if men are infertile they are not so badly affected as women are especially in the developing world now when you look at the financial burden especially united states one cycle of ivs costs an average $12400 which comes with an average success rate of less than 30% women deliver for average egg retrieval performed and while ivf itself is used with less than 5% of infertile couples who seek treatment amounting to only 0.003% of healthcare costs in the united states other treatments can also be expensive with public funding and insurance coverage varying widely worldwide now if you look at the cost of infertility evaluation treatment 0.79% of the annual health care cost is shown by stoval 1.4% annual health care cost in israel iui pregnancy is nearly $5000 ivf pregnancy are nearly $14000 so iui was more cost effective treatment than ivf when you consider the large population base that needs to be looked into now when you look at the causes of infertility there are physiological dysfunctions in female tubal block abnormal ovulation congenital malformation endometriosis and a whole lot of gamut of things that need to be looked into and as far as male is concerned the sperm counts motility quality and the ejaculatory dysfunction that are seen what are the preventable causes the infection lifestyle factors advancing maternal age environmental and occupational hazards are those and unexplained causes genetic endocrinology and immunological problems that need to be really looked at which should be something which can be preventable and unexplained that are seen now when you look at the global health problem is divided into four major categories you have one third in female one third in male one third in combined part and there are about unexplained infertility in 20% out of those where people are not able to diagnose what is wrong in those situations now in female infertility you see anovulation or olive ovulation is 40% tubal disease in 35% with the tuberculosis being a major issue as far as the developing world is concerned uh uterine factors cervical factors and peritoneal factors which um in that order you will see the highest being at the anovulation and tubal disease now what is really bothering us everybody at this point is the time bomb of age <clears throat> the most important single factor deciding the results of all infertility treatments is female partner's age and when you find that women getting married at the age of 35 or later you have a large population of women who are beyond the 35 years of age and then they decide not to have any pregnancies till they settle down maybe another 2 3 years so they reach 38 40 which again is a major issue and after the age of 35 pregnancy and live birth rate decrease steadily abortion rate and pregnancy complications also increase as age advances in women over 45 years of age the chance to achieve live birth by any type of free treatment excluding egg donation is very close to zero i mean you can't expect after 45 to have a woman to produce eggs and then fertilization adequately to take place and implantation and all those issues that take place the ovarian dysfunction with the three main types we are all were aware of the hypogonadotrophic normogonadotrophic and hypergonadotrophic which need to be looked into when the are checking the ovarian function and with tubal damage the comorbidity like the pid endometriosis genital tuberculosis and previous ectopics because again in developing countries when you find infection as a major issue ectopics are also known to be on the higher side histosalpingography is a good investigation evidence b especially in the underdeveloped world where anesthesia endoscopic surgery costs money and it will be cheaper to do that 
So no histosalpiography is also a good test and laparoscopy should be offered especially three years after the uh, pregnancy, the, the marriage and planned intercourse has taken place. The uterine corpus Asherman syndrome, very commonly seen in tuberculous patients, diagnosis by HSG and hysteroscopy associated with hypoaminuria, recurrent miscarriages, fibroid uterine anomalies, again very commonly seen, rarely associated with infertility, but workup will show you in the ultrasound, hysteroscopy and laparoscopy that will show that. Asymptomatic fibroid, there is a tendency for gynecologists, endoscopic surgeons, as well as patients to go in for myomectomies, which are unwarranted. If there are not inside the cavity of the uterus, not going to obstruct the implantation process, and there isn't any major symptomatic fibroid, there is no need whatsoever to deal with small fibroids which are there many times. There is a use of morselation in laparoscopy which has been a big question mark in recent times. One in thousand risk of dissemination of sarcoma. Some suggest in America about one in 350 risk of implantation myomas in the peritoneum. So it has its own difficulties as far as myomas is concerned and the morselation process of removing those fibroids after um, the laparoscopic myomectomy. The cervical factors, again, infection, stenosis, incompetence, immunological factors, and this PCT is no longer recommended as a routine test since there is no predictive value on the pregnancy rate, but may help in detecting infection, immunological cervical mucus sperm factor, and test adequacy of coitus. It's hard to get patients, especially in developing world, for any kind of examination like this after postcoital to have it checked to make sure that the PCT is. Now when you're looking at the treatment of infertile couples, you have anatomical abnormalities where surgical treatment, lysis of adhesion, septoplasty, tuboplasty, and myomectomy cause of infertility. And the surgery may be performed either laparoscopically or hysteroscopically. If the fallopian tubes are beyond repair, one must consider IVF and not just delay it or try to operate on those tubes just for the sake of convincing the patient that tubal surgery may benefit from the surgical exercise. Low-tech treatments world over are necessary because accounting for more than 95% of the modern medical infertility treatments and include the use of fertility drugs to stimulate superovulation, one egg per ovarian cycle and intrauterine insemination, etc. to be done. And high trick treatment like ART, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine estimates that more than one half of couples in the United States pursuing treatment eventually become pregnant. However, success rates vary greatly both within the United States and abroad um, in the clinics. Gonadotrophins, the therapy is expensive and routine use as primary treatment in patients need to be followed closely. On an average, when you look at the per capita income in the developing world and the cost of gonadotrophic in in injection cost, the disparity is so large that the couple may have to sell their land to their flats to whatever in case they want to get pregnant in order to spend for the money that is required for all the injections and IVF treatment that is necessary. There are adverse effects, hyperstimulation, multiple gestation and fetal vestige that can occur from gonadotrophin treatment. Ovarian cancer is another part which has been a worrying factor as far as clomiphene treatment is concerned. A number of gonadotrophin cycles be minimized as 12 or more cycles may increase the risk of ovarian neoplasm when you're looking at the total stimulation protocols that are offered. There does not appear to be an increased risk of breast cancer in women treated with fertility drugs and this has to be properly told to the patient. 
patients, lot of patients feel that by taking any kind of infertility treatment, there is a risk of breast cancer, which certainly is not true um, uh, scientifically. Ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, the OHSS is a major issue because um, if average gynecologists in the clinic start stimulating protocols and trying to see what is happening um, without proper ultrasound evaluation in underdeveloped situations in Africa or in Asia, uh, there is incidence, a mild incidence of OHSS 8 to 23 percent, moderate 1 to 7, and severe 0.25 to 5 percent. And it incidence rises when protocols combine GnRH agonists and gonadotrophins as compared with gonadotrophins alone to induce ovulation. According to Martin et al., if the pre-HCG estrol amount is greater than 6,000 micrograms and or if more than 30 follicles are present, the rate of severe OHSS approves, appear, approaches 80% and estimated fatality rates are 1 per 400,000 to 500,000 stimulated cycles. When the population is 1.2 billion, where half of them are women and 25% of them in fertility age, you can imagine if people start using, for getting success, using gonadotrophins and clomiphene together in large proportion. The OHSS and difficulties that are faced in developing world. The risk of successful infertility treatment, multiple births, 30%, 88% of ART births in the United States were multiples compared to 2.7% of the general population. That's a large multiple pregnancy births. We are concerned very heavily about the multiple births that are happening from ARTs and especially the preterm labor also following the ARTs that are taking place because of the multiple births. The increased risk of the infant mortality rate a crucial public health indicator. And according to U.S. Centers for Disease Control, infant mortality climbed in 2002 for the first time in more than four decades. And that's evident from the ARTs, multiple pregnancies that resulted in the increase in the um, infant mortality and the neonatal mortality. The cost of preterm labor and preterm babies managing is so huge that um, the neonatology units are the cost to the patient is for an underdeveloped country. First of all, the neonatology units are limited, and wherever there are neonatology units, the costs are so enormous that the patient certainly can't afford the cost of a preterm baby resulting from multiple pregnancies. PCOS has been one of the major concerns now in the developing world. To give you a simple evaluation, 35 years ago when I started practice in India, I would see maybe one or two patients a year of PCOS. Maybe we were uh, under-diagnosing a little bit. But today I see every third patient of PCOS. So you can imagine the drastic change that has taken place in the country where the lifestyle changes have happened completely in the other direction to what was 35 years ago. The incidence is 2% in general population, infertility 30% and obesity 30 to 50% in the PCOS. The role of metformin has been of great use as far as PCOS is concerned, reducing the insulin secretion and insulin sensitization, lower ovarian androgen secretion and increase the rate of spontaneous ovulation and improve the ovarian response to clomiphene and HMG, thus reducing the cost of treatment and risk of hyperstimulation. The three randomized clinical trials have shown that the combination of metformin plus clomiphene is effective for inducing ovulation. And the two best studies regimes are 500 mg three times daily and 850 mg twice daily are effective metformin doses to bring about the net effect of 
uh, PCOS. This decreases the incidence of spontaneous abortions and gestational diabetes if continued during the pregnancy. We, by and large, continue the patients who are on PCOS infertility treatment to at least give them for the first four months during pregnancy metformin to make sure that the androgen levels are low so that the risk of abortion is low. Now, there are enough papers and evidence to show that metformin can safely be given in pregnancy right throughout the pregnancy. As a matter of fact, the FIGO recommendations in diabetes, hypoglycemia in pregnancy, we propose that the oral hypoglycemic agent should be preferred, especially in low resource settings where insulin control is difficult to manage for patients in um, uh, calling them or getting the insulin checked, the, the dose of insulin checked on time and again. The new offshoot of clomiphene, which is N-clomiphene in available now, which is anti-estrogenic centrally with property of ovulation induction. With estrogenic peripherally, we increase the cervical mucus and endometrial thickening and a short half-life of 24 hours with less resistance in patients. So N-clomiphene has been advantages compared to the combination of N and zooclomiphene, which is available in clomiphene citrate, which is normally given for the fertility patients. 69% of the patients ovulate with myoinositol, and which is now one very important drug which is available in addition for bringing about ovulation and the hyperinsulinemia control. Dexamethasone or oral contraceptive may be necessary in initial phases and of course diet in PCOS patients to make sure that the BMI is well within the range before you plan further treatment for pregnancies in these patients. Uh, with IUI, there is always an ongoing debate for the last two decades. It's relatively simple, non-invasive, cheap and easily repeatable. But careful selection of patients is important. And there is good evidence in literature in favor of IUI as a cost-effective treatment for unexplained cervical factor and mild, moderate male factor subfertility. Failure of four to six cycles with stimulation IUI in unexplained or mild male infertility is an indication for taking the patient up further for IVF. The timing of IUI is again Two sittings instead of one, single insemination or double insemination have all been tried and both have been equally effective. The explosion of ART has occurred in the last decade and these technologies help provide infertile couples with tools to bypass the normal mechanism of gamete transportation. The probability of pregnancy healthy couples is 30 to 40 percent per cycle with live birth rate of 25 percent. And of course, this will depend on the age. This is to avoid the hereditary disease in offsprings, to address male factor, decrease STI, and to address the trend in desired older age parenthood, and to aid those who face cancer therapies that jeopardize their reproductive potential as um, uh, cancer patients. ICSI and IMSI have been now effectively used all over. And the primary diagnosis of women undergoing ART in Rotunda Hospital in Dublin and the, their study showed that 27% had male factors where 26% has ovulation factors with the remaining um, endometriosis while the same statistics will be different in developing countries where you will find the tubal factor being the largest factor responsible for infertility. The approximate chance of giving birth to a live baby after IVF is about 40% for women under the age of 35. It goes down as the age advances to beyond 40 to going about 13 to 18%. And the success rate generally increases with the number of ART cycles attempted up to four cycles when you are combining those. More pregnancy complications for women over age 50. There has to be ethical 
decision as to when should be a cut-off point as far as women are concerned for pregnancy. With no regulation, some of the centers in India are even impregnated 65 year plus women for and are pregnant. But look at what happens when they get pregnant at that age. 24 women between the age of 50 and 64 conceived via IVF using donor eggs and their pregnancy outcomes were compared with those of 99 women between the age of 45 and 49. 63% women with age 50 plus were hospitalized, which means a huge number of patients, you are subjecting them to the risk of hospitalization, complications that would follow by having them over 50. And during pregnancy compared with 22% of the women who were younger than 50 years of age. So you can imagine three times the admission rate as the age of pregnancy advances. The incidence of pregnancy related diabetes and hypertension was high overall 21% and 28% respectively but the complications occurred within the same frequency in both age groups. 61% of the age 50 plus women delivered low birth weight babies compared with 32% of the younger women which means they have additional problem with the babies as well. And the average gestational age at birth for single babies born to elder, older women was 36 weeks compared to 38 weeks among the younger women, may, having again a smaller gestational baby. pre -gen implantation genetic diagnosis for sex-linked diseases, molecular genetic disorders, chromosome disorders are good. But unfortunately, it has also been used by many centers for sex selection and which has jeopardized the entire um, ecostructure of a population when you have only sex-selected embryo transfers. Surrogates. Health of the selected surrogate woman is a major concern. You find that surrogates are usually chosen from areas which are maybe Eastern Europe or in the developing world, Nepal, India, um, in going to Bangkok to various Indonesia, whatever. And it is unfortunate that the surrogates who are chosen are not really healthy enough to have that baby and they are chosen because of the money factor which is being given to them. If you get a woman of 7 grams hemoglobin who gets pregnant as a surrogate, what do we expect out of that for a baby which is going to come out in a 7 grams hemoglobin and the risk to the mother as well during pregnancy, during labor and ultimately most of the surrogates land up with a caesarean section so you can see the problem that can be faced by surrogates. This issue has been largely debated in developing world and especially in India and last week the parliament has passed a resolution that surrogacy from outside India first of all will not be permitted. So the question of anybody selling for the sake of uh, getting money will not be possible and every surrogate who is chosen for even within the com India where the cost will be far less as against patients who are coming from outside India paying six times the money what is really being charged for an average surrogate. So you have antenatal well-being in care, role of LSCS with subsequent morbidity and mortality. If you have a 139 per 100,000 mortality in a country like India, obviously those mo mothers are going to die. And is it fair for a surrogate to be subjected to that risk of maternal mortality when the risk is always there? You have PGD and PGS screening, screening the aim to reduce miscarriage rate and avoid passing of genetic abnormalities. And of course the now cryopreservation of embryos, eggs, semen, stored in liquid nitrogen. Why do we freeze for oncology, medical, anxiety, surplus embryos to prevent multiple pregnancy and so on. And all these facilities are available in the developing world now. Everything is available at a cost. And 
Overent issue freezing is also being attempted in places like India and regrafted back to site of the ovary. Attempt to make, mature the oocytes from the primordial follicles in laboratory and in vitro uh, fertilizers. The symptoms of endometriosis has bothered the developing world again. It used to be um, a disease of the affluence, as it was called. And uh, the developing world, now all, most of the cities you find patients with en endometriosis with the pelvic pain, infertility, and uh, therefore causing the problems of endometriosis. So the practice committee reports guidelines and statements and opinions of ASRM practice committee has given that even a woman of stage 3, 4 endometrial associated infertility, conservative surgical therapy, laparoscopy and possible laparotomy are indicated. Otherwise, the risk of even um, IVF um, failing after endometriotic surgery being high we need to be evaluated before you decide on when you are going to do IVF in a patient regarding uh, primary IVF as against doing surgical intervention and then going ahead to do the other IVF. The IVF ICSI outcome in women operated on bilateral endometriosis is poor and therefore needs to be evaluated before you go ahead and do that. Tuberculosis Disease of the poor countries, nearly completely eradicated in Western world, but that researched worldwide and become a global issue. Eight to nine million new cases per year and two billion latent TB infections. And this is a major concern in the developing world. India is the highest TB burden country, accounting for more than one-fifth of the global incidence of tuberculosis. Infertility and genital tuberculosis go hand in hand and therefore 85% of these never become pregnant because of the endometrium as well as tubes badly damaged. The alternative to childbirth is adoption, surrogate mothers, childless living. Everything has legal issues when you deal with them. The implementation research is required within developing countries with the global burden of infertility is greatest to make sure that the high price IRT is now reduced to something which is low priced IRT to make it available for women. And the last but not the least, FIGO is trying very hard to make sure that WHO assigns infertility as a medical disorder and a disease. And we are nearly there now with a conglomerate which is formed between ASRM, ASHRAE, FOXY, FIGO and the many of the other um, uh, associations dealing with WHO to make sure that this does happen which will allow the insurance benefit for infertility, pr pregnancy and the newborn which is WHO and UNICEF strategy for every newborn action initiative worldwide. So in conclusion, the serious effects of infertility can largely be prevented or ameliorated no matter what resources are available locally. The condition should be considered an issue of global health problem. Insurance should be available for infertility treatment and pregnancy. The discipline of public health could contribute significantly to the development of policy, prevention efforts and programs in order to alleviate the suffering caused by infertility. Additional advocacy is needed to raise awareness of the causes and consequences of this congestion. Thank you very much for your patience.